this July 17th. On Canada's Parks Day, experience the wonder, beauty, and power of the Canadian North. Parks this Canada July 17th. is pleased to present the End to the Arctic Canada's Trilogy Parks of award-winning films experience for free wonder on YouTube. Beauty. Embark on an inspiring journey with artist Corey Trepanier. Parks Canada is pleased to present the most End to the Arctic Trilogy of award-winning films for free on YouTube. Beauty. Beauty. All of them embark on an inspiring journey with the artist the Corey Trepanier of the world. Good evening. I'm Jill Heinerth, your host for this evening, and welcome to tonight's RCGS Talks. I'm so thrilled to bring you such an exciting program tonight where we have a very intimate and inspiring opportunity to join with Corey Trepanier and learn about his journeys in the North. He'll be uh, talking about his films and his paintings, um, about the Inuit people, the power of nature, and the importance of humanity's role in protecting it. Corey is a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and he's one of Canada's top 100 living explorers. He's also a member of the Explorers Club, and through the Canadian chapter, received the highest award, the Stephenson Medal for his work. He's also a national champion of the Trans-Canada Trail. And tonight, we're going to learn a lot more about his project, his, his uh, programs, his gallery exhibits, all into the Arctic. These, uh, his exhibit at least, um, had 50 oil paintings and three films. The tour uh, began in Washington, D.C. at the Canadian Embassy and then traveled across North America to Monaco, where it opened with uh, Prince Albert II in his Oceanographic Museum, an absolutely incredible facility. And the centerpiece of that exhibit was a 15-foot wide painting entitled Great Glacier, probably the largest Arctic landscape painting in Canada's history. Now imagine what Corey has to go through to create these incredible pieces of art. He's traveling with 120 pounds of gear on his back. Um, traveling through difficult environments with hordes of mosquitoes in that Arctic summer environment, and uh, yet being predated on by uh, Arctic wolves, polar bears, and all kinds of other animals. And he'll share with you some of these incredible behind the scenes stories tonight. Now in 2019, Corey partnered with uh, Cangio Education and they created together a curriculum support guide for K-12 teachers so that they could bring his work into the classroom, an incredible gift to youth all across Canada. Now in the fall of 2021, now Corey is ready to release a coffee table book, a stellar volume that's going to have over a hundred Arctic paintings, stories, messages from Prince Albert of Monaco, from Senator Pat Bovey, from Billy Arnacook, his good friend and outfitter, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Elizabeth Dowdswell, Wade Davis, Robert Bateman, John Geiger, Maury Pelto, and Todd Wilkinson. So incredible contributors to his work. So without further delay, let me introduce Corey and hang on to your questions uh, because we're going to have an opportunity to have a great conversation with him after his presentation. So Corey, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jill, for that lovely, lovely introduction. And I want to thank everyone here for joining us tonight to celebrate the Canadian Arctic uh, as we prepare to release the Into the Arctic trilogy of films this Saturday on YouTube, making them accessible to everyone, anywhere. Uh, I want to thank Parks Canada um, for all their assistance in the field over the years, but also from head office and Destination Canada for helping make this possible to, to just put our films out into the world and hopefully inspire others with Canada's North. Um, I'm coming to you live right now from my barn studio. So this is what it looks like out here a little bit. We have uh, some paintings over there. We got uh, Mount Logan, the highest peak in Canada. 
And over this way, well, I've got a little painting behind me of uh, the Northwest Passage. This one's on the go. And another one on the go over there, which is eight feet high, called Mount Asgard. And I share that because um, this barn, a lot of people have come through over the years and have been amazed at how old it is. Um, it's likely over 100 years old. However, uh, well before a single stick of wood was ever erected, uh, others called this land home. I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples who have lived on and cared for this land for so many generations leading up to here. Um, in this territory of the, Anish of the Anishinaabek, Huron, Wendat, Pandan, Nosoni, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples in the land of the Metis. This land is also part of the treaty and traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Tonight, I wanna to take you on a journey into the Canadian Arctic, into some of the most remote, fragile, beautiful, and inspiring places on our planet. Places that are changing before our very eyes, uh, much of it due to our actions. And because we are about to launch a trilogy of films, I thought it would be a nice time also to share some behind the scenes stories of the making of these films as well. Uh, to help me with all of that, I've been joined by some special guests. The first one you've already met, Jill. Jill is a fascinating person who's spent some time in the Arctic as well and has seen it from a perspective that very few of us will ever see. And so with that in mind, while she is MC tonight, I've also asked if she wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to share about the Arctic through her perspective. So back to you, Jill. Okay, thanks, Corey. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm the explorer in residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and I am also a cave diver. So someone who swills, swims through water-filled conduits beneath the earth. And I have a special interest in water issues and climate issues. And through my cave diving exploits, I was actually the first person to ever cave dive inside an iceberg in Antarctica. And I did that to not only study the, the environment, but to try to bring attention to climate change. Because whether you're in Antarctica or whether you're in Canada's north, um, it is a rapidly changing environment. And I'm frankly a little bit terrified to go back after two seasons of not being in the north due to COVID. Um, I do work in an area that few people ever get a chance to see with remarkable wildlife underneath the ice. So small things, uh, wonderful animal life on the seafloor, but also documenting the ice itself where the base of the food chain literally hangs off the underside of the ice. I also get a chance to swim with some magnificent creatures like walruses or even polar bears, something uh, that I had a chance to do for a film called Under Thin Ice. And frankly, I may never get in the water with polar bears again. It was remarkable, but terrifying. In the North, things are changing fast. And when we go to um, do our work in filmmaking on top of the sea ice, uh, in a place that the Inuit people call the land, uh, the land is going through incredible changes. The ice is breaking up earlier, it's wetter. Uh, we're not as concerned about being cold, we're more concerned about being in rainstorms. And it can be very difficult for us even to get to the spot, uh, the flow edge where ice meets ocean and where so much of the uh, biological life is concentrated. And when I go there and I see this ice heaving up and down, I feel like the Arctic is breathing. Um, but when we do get a chance to go out on the land with our very generous Inuit guides, we have a chance to experience an incredible cacophony of life under the sea ice. It's loud. There's so much going on from ring seals and bearded seals and bowhead whales, belugas, narwhals. Everybody is at the flow edge feeding. And when we get a day like this, where we can get close to animal life for filming opportunities, it's really, really special. So I do treasure these opportunities. Um, like Corey, um, I'm also a filmmaker, and if you want a chance to see more of what's happening underneath the sea ice, then I can point you towards uh, the film that I worked on with Mario Sear and Gala Films in uh, Montreal called um, 
under thin ice. And you can stream that for free on CBC Gem. It's part of the Nature of Things series. And we also have a free app uh, for young people uh, to learn about um, all the animals and uh, life of the North. So let me turn it over to Corey so we can hear some of his behind the scenes from on top of the sea ice. Well, thanks again, Jill. That's absolutely wonderful. And you know, not many people know this, but um, I spent a little time underwater early in my career. Uh, for a period of a few years, I focused on painting game fish. Uh, I actually went underwater, did filming, did photography in order to paint bass and uh, walleye in Ontario waters mostly. And um, my diving was limited to maybe 35 feet. But the idea of being able to dive in the ice, uh, wow, that must be spectacular and frightening at the same time. So kudos to, for all of what you do. Uh, so I'm going to now share my screen so uh, we can get into a bit of the Arctic from this side of things and see how this technology works for me. There we go. Uh, so by now you know my name's Corey Trepanye and that we're launching three films on Saturday um, into the Arctic, an artist's journey to the north, into the Arctic two, and into the Arctic awakening. Into the Arctic awakening is the most recent film that so far has only been broadcast in Europe. So all three, it's a triple global online premiere, I guess you could say. Uh, but where did these films come from? So let me give you a little background. About a decade ago, um, I came across a satellite photo of North America. Uh, I realized that if I want to paint some of the wildest places in Canada or even the world, it was time to head north. So I undertook five expeditions into this region, a million and a half square kilometers of wildness above the Arctic Circle. What's fascinating about this nighttime photo, of course, is the way the lights basically end at the US-Canadian border. And as you go further north, there are less and less of them. So you have just a smattering from Arctic communities. Uh, so when I first stepped foot in the north, it was back in 2006. And it was to paint these incredible wild landscapes. And did I ever find them? Here's a map that gives you a bit of a sense of the journeys and there might be a line even missing on there, but they range from a month to two and a half months in duration. And with a pack full of painting, filming and camping gear, I traversed about 60,000 kilometers through six Arctic national parks, 16 Arctic communities, and explored many, many places in between. I traveled by plane, helicopter, ship, boat, canoe, and on foot, often just with uh, basically a backpack and um, and a tent, and of course, my painting gear, and then my filming gear. Well, I'll get into that later, it's a whole other story. But the parks that I traveled to included Ilovik National Park on the very north, the very west side of the Arctic, Olivik, just above it on Banks Island, Tuktuknogai, or Tuktunogai, south of that area, go to the top of the world, so you can see all the green spots are national parks. And if I could point to them, I don't have a pointer, so you can have to just look at the map. Uh, but those green spots, Katinerpak, Sirmalik, and Iowituk. This is up in Katinerpak by the Henrietta Naismith Glacier. I wanted to explore and experience the land firsthand with the hope that I might be in a position to paint it more meaningfully. As a result, I was able to set up my easel where easels have never been set up before. Uh, resulting in paintings like this, a five foot wide piece from overlooking Tankery Fjord. I found views that were mine alone uh, by actually setting up my easel in a portable canoe, which allowed me to investigate this iceberg up close. Fortunately, this iceberg had flipped the day before, making it a little safer to do, and resulting in this painting. So here's a few of my paintings from the north over the years in Oliver Sound, in the Western Arctic in Ivavik, also in Ivavik, and Ellesmere Island in Katernerpak, and the south central part of, uh, of the Arctic down in Wilberforce Falls area, which is the old name for it. And unfortunately, I don't have the new name memorized for it, but many of the names across the North have undergone uh, changes to their original Inuktitut names, which I think is fantastic. Another place in Ellesmere Island, it received a special home in uh, Washington, D.C., where it hung for about a year at our Canadian embassy. And that opened the doors that allowed our exhibition to actually go to Washington a little bit later, like Joe mentioned, when our exhibition launched there in 2017. Spending time in the Arctic has changed my perspective on scale. Mount Thor, uh, Iowetuk National Park, this painting measures nine feet wide by five feet high. And upon completion, I stepped back and 
I could still see the walls on each side and I kind of felt that I needed something more immersive yet. So I stretched a bigger canvas in the studio here behind me before, before it was renovated, so it looks a little different, and began this painting, Great Glacier. Now, the gentleman that's standing next to me is Billy Arnakuk uh, from Kikatarjawak, who I was fortunate to meet up with in 2007 as he guided me through the land and returned in 2018 with my daughter, Sydney, where we got to reconnect and get out on the land since. He happened to be in Toronto for something uh, a few years back, ran into my mom, they made a connection somehow, and three hours later, he was here in the studio connecting here in Caledon, which is just a wonderful treat for me because I began that painting, the smaller version, of course, a study from the back of his boat while I was out on the land with him. This is it in the rest of the studio before our renovation, and we actually insulated it, and Great Glacier, the centerpiece of the collection. As Jill mentioned, uh, many of these paintings have been on tour since 2017, traveling to the embassy where the premiere was, the Canadian Embassy, Washington, D.C. It traveled to 14 venues so far around the world, out to B.C., this is out at the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco. But I'm thrilled to share that uh, everything has been kind of moving along despite COVID and uh, really affecting a lot of museums' uh, timing and everything else and being able to book shows that uh, a few months ago it all came together and the exhibition is coming home this fall to Science North in Sudbury, Ontario. The opening will be on November 13th and it will be there for three months. This will be the grand finale. This will be the end of it all. And uh, after all, it's been touring now for five years by the time that's done and the works belong to collectors who've been kind enough to let them go on tour and continuing to extend their loans, which has been just wonderful of them. We're also bringing back additional paintings that I've completed since the tour began. So this will make it a really special homecoming along with some multimedia components that are being developed. Uh, Jill mentioned this book. In a way, I hope when this book comes out this fall that it'll allow others to, I guess, in a way, hold the Arctic in your hands. And um, that'll be about 300 pages. And that's coming out this fall, but you can find out more now. It is actually available uh, for those who are interested as, uh, to pre-order. Um, but what I want to get to is a bit of a journey through the Arctic now. Um, I approach my art, both painting and filmmaking, through experience-based expeditions. It's integral in my quest to find authenticity and meaning in my work. These lengthy expeditions have led to many encounters, um, and they've all fed into my work either directly or indirectly. So one way or another, they've all become part of the fabric of each painting that I create and each film that I've produced from the North. So one of those types of encounters is wildlife. Of course, hard not to think of the Arctic and think of its incredible large wildlife like muskox. And do make sure you keep your distance from them when you're actually out filming. This was my cameraman, Ryan Bray, during that trek, getting an amazing shot. But ready, you can see he's actually just behind a little bluff. And so if he has to, he can duck down and there's a cliff to the left. We had an exit strategy, let's say. Unfortunately, we didn't need it. <laughs> Birds of all kinds, uh, gear falcons. Somebody's gonna call me out on that because I don't know which chicks these are, but man, they were so cute. Arctic wolves, tracks everywhere, but it wasn't just tracks. Arctic wolves would slip on us, uh, slip up on us while we were filming, while we we're having lunch, while we we're just walking around like ghosts. Uh, they're curious, they're top of the line predators. And so naturally they got our attention and they got our heart beating a little faster too. Now, uh, Fortunately for us, there were many of these uh, oh, hanging around the tundra or the polar desert, in this case, up on Ellesmere, that kept them very happy and well-fed. Uh, turns out that Arctic, hard, uh, Arctic hare, though hard to find, um, have a built-in curiosity that they just can't get away from. They'll try to hide, and then they'll just kind of give themselves away, which is not good for them, but very good for the wolves and their pups. Walrus and of course, polar bear. This fellow had already taken our spot when I traveled with Billy down Coronation Fjord. We were about to pull over and pitched camp when we saw this fellow up on the rocks. Instead, we crossed the fjord and then uh, set up camp there. And for the next three days, uh, just watch this white spot on the opposite side of the fjord, about three kilometers away. He never really went anywhere, but it made sleeping at night a little more disconcerting. Incredible, beautiful creatures across the north and had the 
fortune to see them. You know, they're big and you have to give them complete respect. They are the top of the line animal up there. And they're just oftentimes curious too, and, but they're always looking for a meal. And um, so while you keep a close eye on these guys, there's another wildlife form in the Arctic that I really have to watch out for as well, because they are, well, very aggressive. They're thick here. Wow, <laughs> time for a bug jacket. Still some beautiful evening light now, just lighting up these rocks. Problem is with bug jackets is I can't really <laughs> see too well through it. I have a look somewhere around here and see what I find. The light's baiting pretty quick. I'd become quite used to the sun not going down for the last month on Ellesmere, allowing me to paint whenever I wanted to. But here, further south, I once again have to battle the fleeting light, in addition to the hordes of mosquitoes. Get some reference shots along the way here. Before the light disappears altogether. Boy, <laughs> just a lot of mosquitoes here. Stitching in the uh, composition quickly. We get a rough lay of it. Dope is wearing off really bad. <laughs> As mosquitoes aren't considered to be an archival painting material, I'll be picking them out. For a view like this, it's a small price to pay. Another encounter that I had across the Arctic, one that was particularly enriching to my life and my time up there especially because I initially went north, to be honest, uh, it was the lure of the land as a painter. And, uh, but as I traveled the north and got to know some of the people for whom it's been home for many years, many generations, it's been particularly uh, uh, eye-opening to find another way of living on the land that, uh, that's very different than going there as a visitor. So communities like Rankin Inlet stopped in at Arctic Bay with this beautiful, colorful mountains around it, Pond Inlet, and then traveling with this fellow here, Billy Arnakuk, who's from Kikatarja Rock I mentioned earlier. That's overlooking Coronation Glacier after we climbed a nearby ridge. We got to some of the most incredible places. Uh, this particular shot really for me just sums up the experience of camping and being surrounded and seeing the mountains and the polar ice caps and the glacier. It's all, it was all just magnificent. Billy also uh, helped me to paint my very first iceberg. So the first iceberg I ever saw was this one. Hey, mama. No. And, uh, okay. <laughs> and I think Don't I hear somebody from the Arctic uh, on the, uh, on the yeah. voice coming in. That sounds like Daisy. Daisy, is that you? Yeah, it's me. You finally can, I can finally see you. Oh, well, let me kick out of the, is Billy there too? I'm yeah, just we, we've, been, we've been trying so hard. Ah. Well, I was just talking yeah. about you right now and showing pictures of Billy, so good timing. Yeah, so, okay. Billy's putting on the headsets right now. All right, folks, so this is a surprise yeah. special guest. Now that you've met Billy uh -huh. in a couple of the pictures, you're gonna meet Billy in person Billy. from Kikatarjewak. <laughs> Hello, do you see me now? I do see you, Billy. Awesome, so glad okay. you can make it. I don't know what was wrong with it. It's like it couldn't connect for a while. Ah, uh, well, I'm glad you're able to uh, make it now. Everybody, this is Billy Arnakuk and Daisy. She's the captain, from what I hear in my conversations with her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Billy, just to get All you right. caught up, I just to get you caught up. I'm just showing a bit, uh, a bit of the north, the folks, and your timing couldn't be better to join us because I was just showing the photo of you and I in the boat while I was painting the iceberg and you were holding the boat in place for me while I sat out there painting. So that was okay, thanks what, to you, I got that painting done. Well, was that in coronation? That was, uh, the first one was actually near your camp. Okay, of okay, I remember. Yeah, All so right. we, have a few, we have a few minutes, Billy. What's the, maybe we were chatting the other day. What's the temperature like up there today? I think uh, I was pretty surprised when you told me what it was. 
Uh, it's really nice today. It's uh, plus 14 today. And that's compared to like 15, 20 years ago, that's abnormal. And the normal temperature would be, it was normal, like maybe plus 10 or plus five to 10, somewhere in that area. But it's normal to get that kind of a weather today. So mm -hmm. on tomorrow, it should be even warmer. It's really nice today. But since we live in a cold Arctic, we don't really mind. We <laughs> don't really mind the warm, warmer weather. It's but, a bit of a break uh, for you, I guess. Time, it's a break for us, but at the same time, it's a concern and due to global warming. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very nice today. Oh, awesome. And um, maybe you can tell me a little bit, it's been a strange time over the last year with COVID in the Arctic. Now, your company, and this is how, just I'll fill in everybody as to how we met. When I went up in 2000, uh, and seven to the Arctic, to the Eastern Arctic. Uh, I forget how I got your name, but somebody gave me your name because you were starting an outfitting company, which uh, is Nunavut Experience Outfitting. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And I think that was the first year that you were doing it or the second year it was pretty early. I think that was my second year. Right, because- uh, The second year, yeah. The year before I just started my business. Right. Actually, so, I, I I work with my father-in-law. He my he, he had an outfitting business, so I helped him for a few years, and then uh, I started my own. Once he couldn't do it on his own anymore. Oh, okay. So you took me out in this boat, um, and I returned in 2018 with our daughter Sydney, and your boats grew since I was there. You had a little wood boat, and now you have big steel. Tell me a bit about your business and, uh, and why you like taking people out. Uh, actually, I was born in Pregnantown, and I used to have a summer job at the, at the park. When the park was quite new, our youth national park was still quite new. So I, 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 I did some summer jobs and I worked with some tourists, but we'd make trails and I was still in a, in a, in a time of establishment. So maybe some of the trails that you went through, maybe to Pang side, uh, I made some of the trails there. So that's how I've been involved with, uh, with, with the tourists quite a bit. And I'm just on the other side of the park, north side of the park. But here it's a very similar, but it's, it's a, little, a bit longer to the park. But um, I always have interest in, in doing something like taking people out. And that's how I started and been in, in, in tourism business ever since. What question do you hear people ask all the time that is uh, that you'd say, ah, oh, not that question again? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Is, is there something yeah. that tourists say all the time that that uh, is surprising when they visit? I'm sorry. Is there something that tourists say when they visit that surprises you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I imagine it's, most of them are, are, are just enthralled with the landscape. <laughs> yeah. I've been involved with so many people through the years. And I, I first started taking people to the park. Then I started a camp. And okay. I started, it, it was more, it was more like accidental. At the time when one time the south side of the park, bank side of the park closed due to the high rivers and uh, north side was still open. And uh, since people were not going to Pang anymore, they had to go to Semin Lake and turn back. And a lot of people at the time, it happened twice, two summers. And 
And that's when I got extra busy because a lot of people was planning to go to Pantisat to come here uh, oh. to cake and hike partial, not all the way from Pan, but I had to go back here. So I was so busy. Then I had a little cabin like for me and my wife and my family. And we stayed there, but I was so busy. Some, some, some days I had to stop by by my cabin and let them overnight so they can their flight in the morning or in the afternoon. And quite a lot of people said, this is a nice place, you know, you should start something here. <laughs> so that, inspi that inspired me to like try it out. I've, I had my first clients and ever since I've been having a uh, summer camp and now I started running a spring, spring camp for a polar bear cabin. Yeah. And uh, I've been doing that for a number of years now, but the last two years, because of the COVID, it's been different. But uh, it's it, we've been busy. It's, it's quite popular here now. Well, for those who don't know, uh, they can visit your Facebook page. But you are a very good photographer. You take a lot of pictures. And almost every day, somehow you manage to post new pictures almost. I think they're generally good night from Kikatajwak or good morning from Kikat. How did that start? <laughs> yeah, but since I've been taking a lot of photographers through years, and uh, they kept telling me, you have a very good eye, you know, in taking uh, pictures. That's when I start to gain more confidence. And personally, I really got interested, and, and I've been taking pictures ever since. Like, I, the one I took, I usually took an iPhone, but I have my own camera as well. Uh, that I, I get into more, like, more a bit more serious photography. Uh, so uh, I've been doing that. I love it, and people love it, and it's something that I want to keep on doing. I am I'm sure. thinking even... Uh, yeah, maybe uh, a book on photography. Okay. Since I have lots and lots of, of uh, films through the years. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about that. I talked to some people about it. So I'm really serious about actually publishing a book on photography. Well, if you do that, let me know. I'll be glad to share it with everyone I know. Uh, that would be great. Okay. Now, we um, just to wrap up. In 2017, sorry, 2007 is when we first met. We went to Coronation Glacier. I have a picture that I, that I, that I showed already of you standing here okay. in the barn with me when I had started the big okay. 15 foot painting, but I started the small one from the back of your boat. So in 2018, uh, I went back there with my daughter, Sydney, who will be on a little bit later. She's joining us for a few, for a few minutes later. And one of the things that we did is we went back to that very same place along Coronation Glacier to find the location where I started the painting from, but also to document how much this massive glacier had changed. Um, because it's three, four kilometers wide, the mountains are a kilometer high, it connects to the polar ice cap back there. You commented about how much you've seen it changed. I've seen it change only in 11 years. But since you were mm -hmm. a boy, since you were younger, you seemed you expressed that it was changing a lot. And what, what did you see? And if you have anything you'd like to say or share with everyone, please feel free to <clears throat> take the stage and uh, before we wrap up and go. Uh, there have been a very big change in even the glacier between Pangnatan and here, when we used to fly over the mountains, over the glacier between two communities, a large area of, of the park used to be like pure white from the glacier. And uh, even that place that we went to uh, in Coronation, that's, that area has melted a lot as well through the year. We used to go through the glacier to go cable hunting over the, I went through that glacier a few times, maybe three or four times by snow machine. 
and go over on the other side to go caribou hunting. We used to do that. It came to the point that uh, because of the crevasses, it was becoming too dangerous. So the community said it's too dangerous, too risky, and people must stop hunting through that route. So okay. people haven't been hunting. Have them be hunting through the glacier. As you can see, when we went there, mm -hmm. it was not ever accessible anymore. We could use, we used to climb by snow machine right up to the glacier. Yeah. And I even at that time, there was a lot more glacier and a lot of it has melted. And there used to be a, like regular skiers that used to ski right from where I took you and go over the glacier every spring and came to the point that they were too much crevasses that they had to turn back a few times and they changed the routing but they used that again for maybe two years and the same people tried again it said changed so much that we can't use it anymore so nobody goes through there in the spring anymore even in the summer yeah. uh, to that coronation glacier anymore so it's really melting there's a big big difference Okay. Compared to 20 years ago. Well, thank you very much for sharing, Billy. And for me, it's been one of the uh, uh, most, uh, the strongest pieces of evidence of how much things are changing up north is the eyewitness accounts of people who live there, for whom it's home for generations. And so thank you for sharing that. I, we could talk all night. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, we don't have all night tonight, but we can catch up maybe another time. Thank you so much for coming on, Billy. Uh, for everyone uh, to know, Billy appears in Into the Arctic 2, and he also appears in a small film that we did from our return visit called Asgard Awaits. It's a YouTube film, about 20 minutes long. Um, so anyway, you can see more of Billy, if you'd like, in our films. Thank you so much, Billy. It's so great to see you again. Uh, look forward to doing it in person again sometime. All right, it's okay, nice seeing you. So Thank hopefully you, Billy. we come back again. Hopefully you come back again and we can do another trip. That would be awesome. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay. okay bye. Bye-bye now. So I'm going to hop back into this presentation and see if we can, where we were. And there we go. All right, everybody. So there's Billy talking pictures right there. You got to hear from the man himself. And um, this is the painting he allowed me to do from the front of his boat. And as we carried on through the north, there were many other people along the way, like Brian, and who uh, showed me how to make some of the best drinking water in the world using ice from the icebergs. Um, of course, at one point in Tay Bay, we uh, had seen four polar bears in 20 minute span before we pitched camp. And so Brian and Anuki from Parks Canada had a big electric fence to keep us safe. I lost the light. I couldn't paint that night because it took hours to set this up. But there's a lot of trade-offs in the north and some like saving your potential life is worth it. <laughs> and then we have some of Sheldon and his son and David E up around Nauiat and uh, uh, on our way off to uh, some islands not far from the community. And then at one point I was hanging out at a tent with uh, Sam and Jaco uh, and something happened that I never really expected. Pennsylvania? Yeah, Pennsylvania. 320 bucks. It's the first time I've ever played Monopoly in the tent and never thought I'd be doing it up here. Yeah. Even though it's getting hot and we're still playing. I got some snacks, coffees, <laughs> TV. <laughs> yes, I lost very, very badly. Uh, but the context of that, uh, you don't mind losing when you're in a tent up in the Arctic and the sun is just going down and they, and Sam and Jacob pull out a special edition silver box, 25th anniversary, and you're invited into the tent to play Monopoly. Well, to me, that's a win in, in anyone's book. Uh, history, another way of encountering the land and people who've gone before. Usually in this case, people from outside places like Fort Conger, a spectacular national historic site up on Ellesmere Island. Uh, you can almost sense the early explorers like Greeley and Peary who traveled here in the late 1880s. And the connection with history was stronger than ever than I'd ever felt before. Uh, here, Dundas, uh, Dundas Harbor, old buildings, old RCMP trading, well, it was an outpost and then it was RCMP camp. It was a variety of things, but the forlornness of some of these buildings that were only used for short windows 
uh, is really striking when you're out there in that environment. And on this particular occasion, while I was working up a painting, uh, the rainy, dreary weather just was so suited uh, to actually trying to convey this emotional experience that one has when encountering a scene like this. Sketches, this sketch is from A.Y. Jackson. Others who've gone before include some artists, including from the group of seven, A.Y. Jackson in 1930, spent some time on a ship called the Beothic and traveled through the North. And at a certain point came across Cape Hotham in his sketch. Uh, I was fortunate years later to get to the same location. And when I arrived, found a big iceberg there that I was able to sketch and later turn into a painting. A connection with artistic history in a place so far removed that very likely AY and I may be the only people to have ever set up an easel at this particular point of water so far from shore in any direction and do some sketching or painting. The Franklin Grace from 1854 on Beachy Island. A real incredible connection to history here. It's visceral almost when you know the bodies still lie underground. And that leaving from these islands, those ships went on to never be seen again. And uh, well, until recently, and of course, nobody survived either. Uh, very tragic story, uh, but a lot of lessons to be learned when we enter into a land such as this, so foreign to people from other parts of the world, and uh, thinking we could do it all on our own without trying to seek local knowledge and learn from those who've made it home. Old graves, and there's old graves, you can see there's a wooden box in amongst the rocks, um, with bodies still inside there. I think it was an old whaler that was there from many, many years ago. The land. So this is the fourth and last of the experiences I want to, category of experiences I want to share. And I can say without a doubt, it was the land that first drew me north. The huge vistas like I'd never seen before, but I was also drawn to incredibly hardy and short-lived life at ground level. These beautiful flora that just show up and disappear sometimes weeks later. Uh, gives you a sense of the fragility, but yet the durability to be able to grow in this harsh environment. This shot I love, it gives a sense of the scale of the landscape. And if you look closely, and if you got an iPhone, maybe harder to see, but if you're looking at this on a big computer screen on the bottom left, you'll see a little yellow tent and uh, up in Katerna Pack National Park. You feel very small in, in these lands. Everywhere I looked, I saw glaciers, waterfalls, incredible. Mount Thor, the highest interrupted rock face on earth. And I camped in its, shower, in its shadows for a few days while working up smaller paintings, which definitely felt way too small. The land also comes in the form of glaciers and icebergs, subjects that I've never found before uh, back here in Ontario. 24 hours of daylight became a new experience for me and a new challenge to paint in. Anybody who likes to take photos will typically say that, you know, sunrise and sunset are those beautiful times when you get the low glow of the sun raking across the landscape. And I agree as an artist as well, but when the sun doesn't set and it just goes round and round, that becomes a challenge to find that point in the day where maybe it's most aesthetically pleasing as it, uh, as it caresses the undulating tundra. So I would often go out and then come back, sleep in my tent for hours, and then go back out again and check things over and over. A few more just miraculous kind of landscapes here. Another big tent shot here. I don't, it's way in the middle there. It's a tough one to see, but there's a little yellow dot in the dead center of the frame. And majestic, majestic rock faces up the coast of Baffin Island, some of the most magnificent and massive rock faces on earth. So behind the scenes, in my films, you'll see a lot of my painting process, but you don't see too much about the actual filmmaking. So I thought tonight, here's my chance. In 2006, I picked up a, my very first Sony camera. Um, and since then, Sony Canada have been alongside me uh, to help me fulfill my vision and share my stories. Over these years, uh, the cameras keep changing, the technology keeps changing, and it keeps getting better and better. So finally, I started shooting 4K up in the Arctic to try to capture the immensity of all the details. And I uploaded the Into the Arctic Awakening film, by the way, on YouTube in 4K. Uh, if you're on a Mac, Safari may have a hard time playing it, it may have to go to Chrome, but for those who can do it, you'll see every detail up there. So the outstanding image quality really allows me to, uh, to bring people into this world, which is why I've been so thrilled. 
And the usability of their gear has been for me, somebody who's a painter first and foremost, um, I've been able to pick up and use their gear quite easily over the years. And it's been, um, what's been, I guess, particularly great is that they allow someone like myself to go out there with only one person or two people, very small crew with long lasting batteries, all those kinds of things that make it possible to solar charge your batteries while you're in the field and actually carry it on your back. But of course, carrying all this stuff, well, it's, it gets a little heavy and it has its, it has its uh, effects on you. Uh, in this case, well, that's just one bag. But when you put it together like this and you have your backpack stuffed with camera gear, camping gear, of course, dehydrated meals, still photography gear, all my painting gear and my painting gear, which goes in my bag is usually the first 25 pounds between my French half box easel, half box French easel <laughs> and my paints and my paint panels. Uh, this is where Jill had mentioned 120 pounds. Yeah, this was it. And this was brutal. Uh, I'm with my brother Carl here. And uh, we did short stretches at a time. And I, I don't know about him, but uh, I know I had a click in my right knee following this 10 day leg of our trip up in uh, Ellesmere uh, that finally went away six months later. I thought I had done permanent damage. I said from now on, never a pack so heavy. So now around 90 pounds or just over 90 pounds is my limit. Um, we're leaving camp here. And then uh, on our way back from camp, uh, we had this amazing encounter, this kind of encounter that as a filmmaker makes it all worthwhile. Gun ready in case? We just finished getting ready for bed when out of nowhere, three Arctic wolves slip in on us like ghosts. They split up at the tent, two down the left side, one on the right, or being stalked like prey. Their stealth is eerie and their gaze piercing. I can barely breathe. Get away, go. Go on. Go. Get going. Don't answer back. And that voice, if you heard it, was this guy here, my brother Carl, saying, don't answer back. Um, it's probably wise words. So Carl not only lugged all this gear around, but he um, shifted into creative mode and learned to film just for this trip. He'd never really done anything but his kids' birthday parties. And uh, so that was wonderful to have him enter this new venture with me. And again, carry more stuff, which was never uh, a never ending story. But all of these things in such a remote environment can eventually start to really test the bonds of brotherhood. Wah, 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 wah. I like you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I shut that thing off. Why are you so gi giddy? Giddy. It happens every day at some point. You set your alarm last night for 9, 10, 11, 12, 2, 3, 5. Keep rolling that stupid thing. Go behind the camera. Oh, I'm over here. So I told you to go behind the camera. Did you listen? You're not the boss. <laughs> no, the boss of me. You roll that stupid camera still? Are ya? I told you to shut it off! <laughs> Both need some rest. Uh, lack of sleep last night, I think, has really kicked in. <laughs> uh, maybe that'll hold him up for a second. I think we're just past the three week mark, and. Oh, Corey, how are you? <laughs> Might be a good thing that he's heading home soon. Oh, kids! Just a little rest, relaxation. Um, and then we'll be good There's to go. A little piece of poop that was in the tent. <laughs> muskox dung. There is uh, muskox poop absolutely everywhere here. Hey, good night, folks. So as I mentioned, behind the scenes, well, there it is. And right now, I would like 
to introduce you to the man behind the scenes and bring on my brother, Carl, to share a few thoughts. Carl, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. And here he comes. <laughs> here we go. I didn't realize you're going to show that clip. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say behind the scenes, I better have something up my sleeve to, uh, to live up to it. And uh, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Uh, being exhausted together, we get to the point where you really do actually get a little giddy, a little delirious. Uh, I think it's a healthy experience that everybody should have once in a while. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, um, that wolf shot that we had before, um, speaking of filming and behind the scenes, uh, there was a shot that actually will only ever live on in your mind, in my mind, and I will never, ever, ever forget it. Um, so I'll describe the shot and then I want you to describe how you felt. Um, so we woke up early one morning and I saw a wolf's feet going past the tent. We had uh, a screen on the side of our tent, kind of just coming up a few inches and I saw feet going by toward the back of the tent. So I reached out into the front vestibule and I grabbed the video camera. And by the time I turned around, we had, uh, of course, 24 hours of daylight. You keep the fly on the tent, but you keep the doors of the fly open for ventilation. Mm -hmm. I swung around. And by that time, there was Carl sitting up in a sleeping bag, shirtless, wrapped in like a tortilla or whatever you call a, it was a burrito. His, and I had perfectly framed his head, his bare shoulder, the sleeping bag, and an Arctic wolf with his nose right in the screen, looking at you no more than five feet nose to nose. Describe how that felt before I finished the story. <laughs> First of all, it felt pretty unbelievable that it was even happening. I mean, <clears throat> here we were uh, in our sleep, and then all of a sudden to be awakened by this and uh, grabbing for a knife. And uh, you know, to be honest, we were captive. So it's a four foot by eight foot tent. It was just the two of us in our gear. And as much as he was curious, um, yeah, I, I thought it was an amazing experience to sit there and see this. And of course, I'm hearing you behind me. Just keep going, keep going, keep, we're going to roll. I'm rolling this. I was like, okay, well, we'll entertain this wolf before he comes in. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Listen, we've got to be fairly brief. There's another guest that I will be getting on. I'm going to change the order up just a moment, everyone, Janet. We have another guest who's waiting in the wings. I will bring her on a little bit sooner so that she can still get out by quarter after eight. Sorry? Yeah, no problem. Sorry for the interruption, folks. We're doing a little directing on the fly. Um, absolutely. So this momentous experience is being captured. The wolf ran around to the front of the tent now and started heading towards our pile of gear. And at the pile of gear, it stood there snipping and I was concerned as I'm filming through the tent door that it was going to lift the leg and urinate on our gear because they like to mark their territory. So in my white underwear, I ran out onto the tundra and shoot it away. I turned back and came to Carl and said, wow. I mean, this is an experience of a lifetime. I sat down and of course you do what you always want to do. He's like, ah, let's look at the shot. Quick, let's look at the shot. And that's when I discovered that the lock button uh, that surrounds my record switch was in lock mode and nothing recorded. And therefore, well, after almost crying for a while, uh, <laughs> we realized that'll be one of those memories that you and I will have to just share ourselves from now on. So um, that was that. That was the wolf. I just want to ask you a quick question though while I have you. It was your first trip to the Arctic. You were all in. You went for a month to, to Ellesmere Island, about as far as you can go in the Canadian Arctic. You mm -hmm. left your regular job, family, everything behind. Um, when we were heading up there and we were in the Twin Otter and you were in the passenger seat looking down as we hit the beginning of Ellesmere and the glaciers just began rolling, what went through your head? Well, is this even real, to be honest? It's a completely different world that um, you keep hearing adjectives being used. It's, it's huge, it's magnificent, it's this, it's that. Um, but nothing really does it justice. You find yourself running out of words to describe what you're seeing because nothing anywhere is like what you're in the middle of. And it, it's absolutely breathtaking. Um, we tease about, we talk, and we talk a little bit about going to an, on another trip. And that, that's for real because to experience that again would be fantastic. There's nothing like it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, everyone out there, so you know, you can find Carl in Into the Arctic 
2, you can also find him in Into the Arctic Awakening. And that part of the Arctic Trilogy, you can also find him in True Wild Kluwani. Uh, not the 24 minute version for Parks Canada, but the full length version. Uh, anyhow, you can see Carl all over the place if you like. And thank you so much for joining me, Carl. I'll get back to the presentation. We'll adjust a couple of things and we'll go from there, but awesome for, for you to come out and join me tonight, brother. Appreciate that. Hey, thanks for having me be, uh, be part of all this stuff, Or It's been an absolute privilege. Thanks so much. Memories for when we get old and gray. Already thanks, there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank all you. right, folks, I'm going to uh, switch back to my presentation mode. And if you can bear with me, I'm gonna make a little adjustment because one of our guests uh, is a little, uh, has to be gone in 15 minutes. I don't wanna miss getting her in here. So there we go. Bear with me a moment and reunited. So this refers to the trip back up to the Arctic in 2018 with my daughter, Sydney. She was 19 at the time with two daughters, but she was able to come up with us, join us standing on a piece of ice there. And the reunited part was that it was Billy and I getting back together for the first time in, oh, whatever the math is, 11 years. Uh, and also Sydney got a chance to meet Billy and hang out with him as we went sketching icebergs and stayed at his cabin. But one of the goals we had was Mount Asgard. I wanted to paint it so badly, which you saw behind me in, in progress. And Sydney, well, we had some other plans that we had developed along the way. Uh, she joined me because it was an awesome experience to hang out and, uh, uh, and she has a great interest in Oh, you know, Norse mythology, a lot of the names of the, of the uh, mountains up there have Norse names like Thor and so on and Asgard and Loki. And she likes the Marvel movies. So as a dad, I use that to say, hey, you want to come with me and carry a 75 pound pack for two weeks and exhaust yourself every day? Um, so that did it. So we went off and we camped in some magnificent places like this in front of June Valley Wall. And over here with Asgard in the background. And well, Asgard's here again because I love it so much. <laughs> they were to duplicate. But on our way to Mount Asgard, which I wanted to paint, we climbed up the Turner Glacier, which you can kind of see a little bit of at the bottom of this photo. And here's where the other plan unfolded. I just did the photo shoot on the glacier and I am completely frozen. Not one of my better ideas, but it went really well and I'm super happy with it. And now it's time to go warm up. <sighs> Finally got my hot chocolate. I've waited two weeks, two weeks for this hot chocolate. And may I now take a moment to introduce Sydney all the way from Victoria, BC. And able to join us between jobs, that is dedication. Uh, Sydney Brooks, where might you be? Hi, I'm right here. <laughs> oh, there she is. Awesome. Hi. Nice to see you. Glad you can make it. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Sydney works at the Bateman Foundation Gallery of Nature, right down there in downtown Victoria. Uh, of course, uh, the namesake to Mr. Robert Bateman, who's an incredible artist who, uh, when I was 15, was an inspiration. And so Sydney's working there and, and doing some other things. But I want to bring you on, Sid. And uh, just, uh, I love that you came with me and I love seeing young people experience nature. And on this particular one, it was a different kind of experience. Now you and your sister were with us on our first Arctic expedition. Many people may not know that if they haven't seen the first Into the Arctic film, but you were seven years old and your sister was 11. So you may not have as many direct memories, but this one, I think you do. So what was the most unexpected challenge you had during the trek? During our trip in 2018, um, one of the, it was a challenge, it was also just fascinating to realize this, I, um, is the vastness of the landscape in the Arctic. We would be hiking for, you know, a, a day or so, and we would have a goal in mind, like they had emergency camp, um, campsites, like little cabins on the hike, and we could see it far away. And we'd be like, you know what, it looks like we can make that by end of day and <laughs> hike for seven hours, and then it'd be eight hours, and we're hiking for 10 hours, and it still looked the exact same distance away. And it was, it was really tough and it, it doesn't help with motivation when something you can see and looks like it should take less than seven hours, it takes you actually three days to make it there. Um, so your my entire comprehension of time and space and the vastness of everything was completely warped. I, I had to start anew. 
Oh, uh, that is absolutely uh, my experience as well. And I think what it's done, what's done for me, and I think maybe what I've seen happen to you is when you're in those situations where you just have to keep pushing, you find yourself maybe digging into a part of yourself that you don't tend to experience at home, uh, physically, mentally, trying to find that stamina to put one foot in front of the other because we had to reach the destination for the boat pickup. And those last two days of our 14 days were brutal. They took forever to get to the end and it was a gray. And even at one point, I remember we crashed in the tent and we just wanted to sleep, but you had learned or already knew the all important thing is no matter how tired you are, you don't go to bed on an empty stomach after hiking for seven hours um, carrying what you did carry, which was like a 75 pound pack. Um, crossing rivers were another thing that would have been, uh, and as a dad, I felt this responsibility because I'd been to the Arctic a few times, of course, but you always feel this if you take your kids anywhere. But where I think it really was at its peak for me was the river crossings, because that's <laughs> if anything's gonna happen anywhere, it tends to be when you're crossing these icy, brutal, cold, uh, leg red turning rivers, um that are flowing sometimes really fast especially after some of the rain that we had and um but you you were a trooper you went through that and then i discovered she had an advantage because she's 510 and i'm 57 that her knees are actually at least this much higher than mine so when i'm up to my knees in the water she's up there like her calves or something so that did help but uh how did you find crossing those rivers um honestly i i never even thought about the height thing i guess that did assist me a, a little bit um, <laughs> River crossings, actually, I, there was only one that was um, a little wary, but otherwise I was actually okay with them. And probably mostly because you were always so adamant about saying how dangerous they are. And you were always saying, you have to be careful on river crossings. There's no goofing around. There's, you're, you're no making jokes, no nothing. At this point, it's the only point where you have to be absolutely serious because it's really dangerous. And because of that, I took it really seriously. And so I like hyper-focused in whenever we did a river crossing and it was in, get in, get out. And so it made it really easy. Um, yeah. and therefore kind of uneventful. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you want when it comes to river crossing. Exactly. Yeah. Now you have a bug for travel just to wrap it up. Is there anywhere you'd like to go travel next when, uh, when, you know, things are starting to open up a little bit so we can actually start talking about these things. Yeah. Well, honestly, everywhere really, but I think, um, one of the, First places I'd like to go is Scotland. Um, my sister, your daughter, Andy. Yes, she is. <laughs> she um she graciously gifted me a trip to Scotland um, a couple Christmases ago that we never got to go on because of, of the pandemic. So I would love to get to to go there. There's just so many amazing landscapes, especially in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, there's so many so many similarities, um, I think, to the Canadian landscape. Um, just in, in such a similar way, but also such a unique way. Um, and just the culture. I think I would love to go to Scotland. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to doing another trip with you sometime. Sid, thank, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing a bit about your experience out there. Take yeah. care out there and uh, don't work too hard. Of course. All right. Bye. Thanks a lot. All right. So if that just get me back on screen for a sec. So I see it's 8.06 and um, we did say we'd go till eight. So I don't know if we can do a show of hands. Uh, I do have another guest <clears throat> and I do have a bit more of a presentation I'm near the end of it though, getting very close. Uh, but we promise that there will be a draw uh, at the end. So I need some guidance. We could do the draw right now so that everybody who's there participates or we can simply uh, finish up my presentation. I got another maybe 10 minutes to go. I'm thinking maybe, maybe 12 minutes. Uh, so if anybody can send me a chat, I guess I should chat, chat. Any thoughts about that? If I don't hear, I'm just going to keep talking. No, just kidding. Uh, leave the draw for closing. Okay, we're on then. We're going to carry on. I'll wrap up. Let me get back to the presentation, folks. And share this screen. Get back over here. And I need to back up just a little bit to where I was going to go next. So we now have, ah, okay, how to kill a camera behind the scenes. So I thought, how appropriate, I'll show you how to kill a camera in three easy steps. First, begin with a beautiful iceberg. Get your shot of the iceberg and then have some awesome guides that you can turn the camera to. Then you gotta run around the boat to get ready for the second shot. Now the second shot here is getting ready, it's getting close, it's not there yet, boom, there it is. Okay, we got the shot, awesome. That's what I want the iceberg. And then you get greedy. And when you get greedy, 
Oh, it's putting the camera down close to the water in order to get a low angle shot. And you saw that little splash? That little splash right there. Wound up uh, getting a little too close to the salt water, and now it's slow roasting above me here as I'm trying desperately to dry things out. And here's a view from Tommy's cabin. So the context though, is why this mattered. We were entering Tengik Tualuk Ukutik Ukuti, which it used to be called Samford Fjord when I was there. It was for, it was the beginning of the trip out. We stayed at one cabin, one night, and then we're heading out to camp for the next nine days or something. Otherworldly landscapes like this. And now that my camera was dead, what was I going to do? Well, I got very, very fortunate that uh, Martin, uh, a friend of mine who was filming for the first two weeks and then had to go home, he left me a small camera with an underwater housing and a one hour battery. Um, and that was all for the purpose of uh, just shooting some underwater shots for the next week while I was up with Sam and Jaco in this incredible part of the world. Um, and now that's all I had for a week. An hour battery, a little camera, a tape. This time, I think I really did cry. <laughs> and if not, I, I just could not believe this had happened. Um, I should be clear, by the way, I mentioned Sony cameras that I've been using all these years. That's the one leg of the one trip that I did uh, where it wasn't a Sony camera. I'm not going to say what it was, but, uh, but they had too many openings around their buttons, apparently, and let the salt water in. That's what I'm going to say. Um, so I started thinking of the old days when they used to shoot on four, uh, four millimeter, or what is it? Sorry, four minute long film reels. And that really sort of got me to change my mind and to think differently and to think, what do I need to actually get the story over these next nine days and make every single shot count? It wouldn't be as high quality, but it was still there. And now I have this in my Into the Arctic 2 film. And it was all thanks to Martin who loaned me his camera as a last minute idea so I can get underwater footage. And this is Martin, Martin Berkman. He's a cameraman, he's an artist. He's a multifaceted, uh, talented uh, artistic uh, force. And he applied his videography skills on my Into the Arctic 1 and my Into the Arctic 2 journeys for a stretch in each one. Here we are up in uh, Ayahuituk National Park with heavy packs. And with the heavy packs for a change, and that feels so good. One of the things Martin was doing though while he was up there was shooting 3D footage. As you can see, he's got two cameras rigged up to shoot 3D. And what I'm really excited about is first of all, to introduce you to Martin, because not only is he uh, a very talented artist, he's a super, super nice guy. And um, so please welcome all the way from the Yukon, uh, Martin Berkman. Hey, Corey. <laughs> and there he is. Good to see you, Martin. How's it going? Well, man. Well, thank you. It was, uh, this... I'm glad that I did the camera with you. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> Who knows? It would have been your last resort. <laughs> well, that was absolutely. And that, of course, taught me another lesson. Never go into the field without a backup camera. I mean, no matter what it is, no matter how it be, take something as a backup. Now, Martin is more than all those other things I mentioned, in addition to becoming a really good friend over the years. For me on that trip um, to Ayahuitic, when he joined me, when we hiked across, he was there for the first two weeks, we, we did 10 days uh, in, in, in Ayahuitic National Park. Martin also became a, a guide in a way. Martin had been to the Arctic before. You'd been to Ellesmere 20 years before and Baffin Island before. And the value of having somebody who's so comfortable walking in the wild to teach me the ropes, because I didn't know much about this river crossing stuff, to now, as you can see from my chat with Sydney, those skills that you passed on to me, I was able to then ingest and become part of my tool set to bring my daughter safely through the Arctic as well. So thank you for that too. Yeah, that's a pleasure, Corey. And, uh, you know, thank you for the invitation to join you and assist you. I was able to 3D work at the same time in Ivavik and in Ayuituk. And I've reflected often how, as you were saying, you know, the effects in the Arctic 
are ones that, uh, and very often unknowingly, and the work that you're doing through painting is giving people a sense, a sense that you as the artist form bridge for uh, to know that place and to be sensitized to it. That's also why I now work at 3D. Actually, the, you were speaking about the first time I was up in Ellesmere and Bath. And that was similar to you with uh, your uh, film gear. There was no digital uh, video <laughs> gear. I had, I had four still cameras, medium format, uh, regular format, and uh, spending a month walking in this place. And it was there, actually, uh, from that, uh, created a book of black and white work about the landscape that an intention through poetry, through visual poetry, to provide viewers with a, a sense of place, much as I find you do so eloquently through paint. Something else I yearn for, give people a sense of presence because we affect the world so much without an intimate relationship with it. And how else can we accomplish it than by creating art, which basically bridges the audience's personal experiences with these remote geographies. That's why I've been working in 3D ever since that time, once it started to be accessible in around 2005. And by the way, Corey has featured in two of my 3D video installations and it's just delightful <laughs> to be able to put art interacting with the environment and that the viewer can, in a sense, sit with the artist as the artist is being inspired and responding to the place. Well, that brings us to an exciting announcement, which uh, uh, I, that I'm pleased to let folks know about one way or the other, this is happening. So our homecoming exhibition at Science North in Sudbury um, will feature a walkthrough space where you'll be able to walk in and experience the Arctic through Martin's 3D footage, much of which he had shot while on those two expeditions with me. Um, to have people sense the Arctic even more closely as part of my exhibition with the paintings there is something that we've been trying to do for a few years but many venues didn't have the capacity to uh, or the technology. We've got all that lined up now and so really excited to uh, be able to share some of Martin's work in context of our Into the Arctic Homecoming exhibition uh, later this fall in Science North. So that's going to be exciting. Look forward to that and working with you on that over the next few months, Martin. Awesome. And something I, I just want to express is gratitude also to the Inuvialuit, to the Inuit across the Arctic, to the Vunta Gwich'in in northern Yukon, just for their, their graciousness in letting us explore and be inspired on these lands. It, it's uh, profound, really, oh. uh, going to what is the edge of the world that we are familiar with and live in? I find it so invigorates our perspective of how life is a life is precious for one, but also the possibility of life that Earth harbors life is fragile. It's delicate. In the Arctic, we go to the very threshold of its possibility. And it, that's something the more we are aware of it, my goodness, the more we can really behave responsibly on this earth. And I have to say one other thing, because I had a show at the Vaitman Gallery in Victoria, and I've seen you work in the field, and I've seen your small uh, sketches that were your study paintings, which were beautiful. Oh, thank you. Just how you have rendered the light in these environments on the scale that you have, but even in your smaller paintings. Uh, I urge everyone who's listening to, of course, appreciate the films and appreciate what you can see on Corey's website. But if you have a chance to see the paintings uh, personally, it's, it's an experience uh, that can't be equal. <laughs> so I highly encourage people to see the paintings when you can. The, the light is truly a, a, it's a reflection of the light that we see and feel when we are in the Arctic. 
Well, thank you so much for your kind words and poetic words. Martin, it's great to see you again. I've got to wrap up my couple last pictures of the presentation. And there's a draw, so I don't want anybody to lose out. But uh, I've learned so much from you being out in the field with you, your capacity to just soak in nature on such a calm, peaceful level. Um, and so I think of you whenever I'm out there and I'm actually slowing myself down. I think, ah, awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm being Martin. Like, <laughs> Take care, my awesome. friend. You too. Take care. Cheers. Thanks a lot. All right. So uh, we're down to the last few shots. I'm going to skip back down again. And uh, basically, actually, we are at the last shot right there. Let me say it. So, you know, when exploring the vast Arctic wilderness, I feel small and humbled by the raw power of nature. And I sense wonder in a remote and fragile land. Um, over the years, uh, a sense of sadness has grown in me about how humanity is affecting such dramatic changes across this land, impacting all life. It's my hope that tonight and through watching the films, that some of that will be passed along and that we all carefully consider our actions and how they impact this wondrous world. Thank you very much. Corey, that was absolutely exceptional. I think we are all completely moved by your amazing artistic talent, just capturing the light and the essence of such a rare environment. And I mean, I know my first journey to the Arctic, I, I would see places in Iqtiarchuk or Mitamalik and go, oh my gosh, that's Lauren Harris or that's Amy <laughs> Jackson, but it's different. And so just as the group of seven has created this incredible visual archive, you have as well. I mean, these are endangered environments and your work will live on um, in capturing a, a beauty that is changing and adapting. Um, yeah. well, thank you, Joe. Thank it's you. Just amazing. But before we have you do your draw, I don't think anybody's well, going to complain by spending a couple of minutes answering sure. a few questions because the chat has been blowing up and I would love to give um, people a, a Oh, okay, so you want to do that? Okay, sure. Just a couple Whatever questions. Order works. Hey, you're the MC. You're in charge. Yeah, so. I think we'll, we'll, we'll just hit four questions here. One person so, was wondering, have yes. you learned any Inuktitut? Do you speak any of the uh, local languages? Not enough. To be honest, I'm embarrassed that I don't know more. Much of my time is in a tent up in somewhere where I'm not in the communities. And often the communities where, uh, that I passed through, I didn't spend a lot of time in it because the subject matter I was seeking to paint were usually further out. So I know some basic stuff, but, um, but no, it's on my list. I should be learning more, but I'm learning some of the new place names, as you can see me trying to pronounce them. Uh -huh. Did you have a favorite yeah. word that you would share with the audience? <laughs> Oh, that's putting me on the spot. <laughs> okay, I won't do that then. <laughs> now we had another- Continue oh, back, no. <laughs> okay, there you go, yeah. Well, you're, you're handling some of the place names like a boss, so that, oh, that's thank great. You. <laughs> now, uh, we had another uh, viewer that was asking about your art process. So are you just sketching and doing small study paintings in the field? Are you doing any full-size paintings in the field? And are they full of mosquitoes or do you do that all when you come home? <laughs> Well, you see a lot of that in the films. So what I'll do is actually take my half box French easel and actually, if I just take this out for one second, can you hold that for a sec, please? Thank you. There we go. Seeing as I'm in the studio, this is the uh, half box French easel that I tend to take with me in the field. It's uh, got legs that drop down to the ground, the top lifts up, I can put large paintings, small paintings, but it weighs a lot. And I will start everything in the field that I possibly can. If I have time at all, I will set up my easel. I will set up my uh, Belgian linen. I work on Belgian linen that's mounted to board and um, get as far as I can. The purpose isn't to finish the painting. I gave up on that because I just can't finish it once it be The weather changes too much. The lighting moves around. And now what you've began a couple hours ago is how it's different than photography often. What I began two hours ago looks completely different. But that results in my paintings often being a representation of my experience in that place. So that while I'm painting something and I see the light change an hour later, I'm like, wow, I love the way it's striking that distant mountain. And I'll paint that in. Uh, because what I'm not trying to do a 60th of a second, I'm trying to evoke as much as I can 
the feeling I have and the experience of being there, but in realism in a way that can sort of really engage people with a sense of being there too. Um, in terms of mosquitoes, yeah, they get into my paint while I'm out there all the time. I usually pick them out when I'm back in the studio because I don't think they're too archival to leave them in the paint. And then prove me wrong, a year ago, I saw that Van Gogh, they, under a microscope, they found a bug in his paint from 100 years ago. So maybe I could leave them <laughs> there. Uh, but I don't want that. Again, on the surface, that could be a distraction to try and let people see in. And then some of those, maybe out of every 10 pieces I start in the field, will have such an impact on me that I will then take two or three of those and do them on a larger scale. Um, and then, you know, once I go through finishing that small piece, which technically I need to let dry, uh, because I'll often go over with many layers and oils take a long time to dry. Um, then I will actually uh, uh, work up a large piece once I've finished a small piece and realize this doesn't quite say it all. There's more, there's so much more potential that I need room to express on a bigger canvas just to physically allow that space and to hopefully convey to the viewer standing in front of a big canvas that sense of, uh, that I had. So. Fantastic. I, I can't believe the, the body of your work. I paint as well, but just the, the um, massive number of large canvases that you've created is oh. mind blowing to me. Oh, well, thank you. Now, uh, we have a lot of people who are really interested in the fall exhibit at Science North, and they were yes. curious about why Science North? What brought you there? Well, in the, um, the, in the building of a traveling exhibition, uh, we connected with a uh, partner, uh, David J. Wagner, who's a tour director, and we developed it going to a variety of different places. And the way museums take on exhibitions is they decide what they want to have or if they're maybe building their own exhibition. And so it comes down to the, not us choosing, but which museum after being presented with the opportunity decides that this is a good fit for them. And so um, we even had the Ontario Science Center was very interested in Toronto. The science component was quite interesting because it would really give their audience an opportunity to see the science that they have through the eyes of an artist and connect perhaps in many ways on a more emotional level or at least have greater interest in the science because now you see what's at stake, you feel what's at stake and what the science is talking about. Um, but with COVID and all, as much as Ontario Science Center was interested, they could not come to any decisions before the end of last year. And Science North being a little bit more out of town, um, were able to, therefore, uh, we're going to Science North and they're really keen to have the show. They're wonderful people to work with. And for me, it's a homecoming in a lot of ways because my first serious painting trip when I broke away, I did commercial art for 10 years and then I got serious about doing my own painting. And when we did that, I started a project called Coast to Canvas uh, on our website, coreytrapania.com. You can see projects Coast to Canvas. So we got all pictures and stuff from there. Our daughters are two and a half and five years old. We canoed and camped for a month in each season on Lake Superior and Georgian Bay. So this is like right up in that neck of the woods. So being able to bring it all back home to Science North is a really lovely fit. So it opens on November 13th. There's a, we find information all over our websites. Um, and then there'll be a few other events maybe happening around there that we'll, I guess, share later. Fantastic. Well, those of us in Ontario are thrilled that it's going to be close, close by so we can see it. Wonderful, thanks. Um, and one last question before our draw, um, where is your next adventure or um, series going to happen? Have you got any thoughts? Well, I do. Uh, we have a project in the wings, uh, but due to COVID, it had been delayed a number of times, but it was somewhere accessible, which is back to this homecoming idea. And it was the idea of going uh, to Quetico Provincial Park. And now I have not shared this with anybody publicly yet. So the site is there, but I haven't actually put it on the site yet, if you will. Anyhow, it's called a quest for quietude. And it's the idea of canoeing in Northern Ontario in Quetico. Quetico, because on our way across to the Western Arctic on that very first trip with our daughters, we stopped there, we camped, we canoed. And we took it all in and then we carried on through the Arctic. And I've always wanted to go back. When I started thinking of this idea without travel, I thought, you know, here's an opportunity after so many years of painting the North to kind of come back to where it all started for me, Northern Ontario landscapes, to paint trees again, to see the night sky full of stars again, which is something I haven't done for a while. And this year is the 20th anniversary from when we did that very first trip with my wife and our daughters, uh, Coast to Canvas. So they're all kind of many, many tie-ins. So the date is currently uh, uh, just uh, stay tuned for a date announcement when we're ready to roll, but everything's in place. Fantastic.
And it won't well, be a 50, it won't be a 15 year project, by the way. <laughs> just saying. There you go. Okay. This project, by the way, was only supposed to be four years. I thought a trip, a trip, a trip, an exhibition. I went north, mind blown. You'll uh, never get the north out of your heart. You'll be going there no. for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'll be back at some point for sure. Yeah. So while Wonderful. you um, start to prepare to draw a name, I just want to give a few thanks for this evening. Do. Um, yeah. So a special thanks to Billy and Daisy who uh, who joined us all the way from Kickstarter and uh, Sydney and Martin and Carl, thank you for joining us. Um, and also huge thanks to the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, rcgs.org, uh, that has made this event possible and Angelica yeah. behind the scenes awesome. running Control the thing. technology. Um, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and Canadian Geographic promote geographic literacy, education and exploration. And we also appreciate your support um, to continue those efforts as well. So Corey, do you have a name for us for the big draw? I don't have a name yet, us? but I thought I would show everybody what it is first. Oh yeah, please. The draw is for. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. So there we go. So this is Along the Ice. Wow. This is a painting I began from Billy Arnacook's boat. The original, of course, is a much larger. This is a canvas jiggly reproduction. It's also the painting that's on the cover of our new book, except for you get to see the rest of it here. So this is beautifully framed. And now it will be time for the draw. Janet was kind behind the scenes to prepare all the names for me. So let's rip through here. Oh, we gotta see, gotta make it all full transparency here. All right. The winner is, no drum roll sound effects. Here we go. <laughs> this is small writing. I think I might need glasses. No, here we go. It is Terry Tarno. Terry okay. Tarno. Come on up, you're the next contestant. No, you have one. Thank you very much. <laughs> All um, right. Terry Tarno, I don't know if I have your email address. We probably can get it through the back end, but mm -hmm. if not, reach out to us. My email address is on my website. Well, congratulations to Terry and thank you everyone for joining us this evening and please um, get on to YouTube in a couple of days when you have an opportunity to see all of these remarkable films and watch for Corey's upcoming book into the Arctic. It's um, going to be extraordinary and I would imagine it's going to sell out pretty quick. So uh, well, thank you. please check it out and head on to his website and thank you so much for such an enlightening evening, evening and for capturing such a remarkable time and space um, through your images. Um, they're absolutely extraordinary. Well, thank you very much, Jill, for doing such a lovely job hosting tonight. I appreciate all that. And I appreciate the RCGS as well for helping me to share my story and for everyone who came out tonight. Thank you so much.